not count. Nothing counts. This is not official. Wait, is it official? It's official. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello, Paulina. Hello, Katie. Hello, Maria. Hello, Alan. I got a hand wave. Thank you. That's awesome. Hello, Cheska. Hello, Michelle F. Hello, Shy. Hello. And now I'm doing the chat. Hello, Stephanie. All right. Oh, this is like, all right. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, uh, now I'm doing the chat and the board is coming. The board is is like coming. Uh, good afternoon, Michelle. Q oh, there's more. Good afternoon, Maria. Good a There's Shy for real. Awesome. Thank you. I mean, it's always real or it's never real, but all right. Good afternoon, Fariel. Good afternoon, Michelle F. I think I said that. Okay, that's Shai. And then there's Shawnee and there's Emily with an E. And there is Michelle Q. Oh, and then they're doing that crazy thing again. Okay, that is, it is really cool. You've tried, it should never, it should never, I know, it should never surprise me or confuse me, really. It's just like, okay, and there's Harrison. Hello, Harrison. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. But yeah, you'd think I wouldn't be confused by like a class. It's like a class, but yet it is confusing. All right, hold on. The board is just coming and we'll go. Wait, can you even hear me? Wait, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. Well, who was that? Wait, that was that was Shawnee. Thank you, Shawnee. Got it. And that's yeah. points for you. That's an example where you could submit points for using voice. Thank you. But either way, I totally know that was you. All right. Awesome. Um. Okay. Okay. I'm just seeing. Oh, 31. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. The board should be, and we'll get rolling. Oh, and that was, sorry, and I didn't say hello to, I said hello to Harris. Hello, Jada, and hello, Fariel. Okay, awesome. Wait, where is Jada? I, okay. And then also, hello, Freddie. Hello, Marilyn. Hello, Victoria, who I've known for years. I don't know what the confusion is there. Um, Brooke, hello. Oh, that's funny. We used to chest things in the elevator. Uh, you can. You can without my permission slip. You certainly can. Um uh, the more fun thing is testing relativity by going up the down escalator, but okay, whatever, uh, in a mall, um, after shoplifting, that's a joke. That's not even appropriate. Okay. And Mohammed, I didn't say hello to, I don't think hello. And here comes Yavi and I'm not stalling away from the board. Here comes, well, I am. Okay. Close transfer. Yes. So the board should be okay. Here comes the board. All right, and we're going to get, um, I think, if I didn't say hello to you, I apologize. I, if I haven't, and you may, maybe that's a cue that you want to say hello to, but I think I've said hello to everybody. I think everybody's here. This is a big class. We're excited, blah, blah, blah. I'm still sick. We're all sick in one way or another, I'm sure. I mean, we chose this major, so we must be. Okay. Um, we, I believe, we are going to get straight to we're going to start talking about homework 1B now. Now, again, even technically, even technically homework 2 doesn't even get assigned until Wednesday. But again, let me just remind you, we're going to be on this homework for a while. Like, even if I'm super, like, we're not going to finish going over it today. So no matter, it's all a matter of always just do the next right thing, so to speak. Just do the next, like, once you get to a certain point with this, then you move on to the next. It's whatever you haven't done, you do next, et cetera. It's about the sequence more than it is about the dates. Um, um, so I'm going to start going over homework 1B, like essentially now. Uh, summary of last class. I think you got it. I mean, hopefully it was like a little bit fun or whatever. But the takeaway from the last five minutes of last class, the takeaway is that all of physics is about things moving through time and space, right? All of physics, no matter, literally, no matter what level you're doing it at, no matter what the course is called, no matter what experiment you're interested in, all of physics is about things moving through space and time. The difference in a way between one type of physics and another or one course in physics and another is what type of things you're talking about. And the fundamental distinction, the basic distinction between physics 203 versus physics 204 is that in physics 203, you were dealing with particles, even if they were very large. 
uh, and physics 204, ultimately, we are not dealing with particles. A particle is a thing that is very thingy. In physics 204, we're dealing with very unthingy things. Obviously, that's not the technical or proper way to say it. What I really mean is, just again, to summarize the end of last class, a particle well, intuitively, informally, informally, a particle is something that is massive, palpable, tangible, um, thick, uh, discrete, countable, distinguishable from another particle, right? I mean, these are all informal words. A particle is like a physical object you can relate to, and that can be separated from another physical object or that you can imagine yourself touching or you can imagine yourself counting separately from another object. Those are all informal descriptions of what a particle is. I honestly, I think one of the most important features of a particle really, even informally, is that it is discrete and countable. I actually, that's actually less informal than it sounds. But so a particle is like a grain of sand or a Volkswagen, or, or a planet. It doesn't matter how big it is. It matters that you could say, this is the particle. This is where it ends. This is where now space begins, or this is now where another particle begins. I could count planet number one, planet number two, planet number three, or Volkswagen number one, Volkswagen number whatever, right? Like, so a particle in effect is bounded, is separable from other things in the world. You know where it begins and you know where it ends, and you could put a number to it, right? That's what, what is, but what is it formally? Formally, what a particle is, is something that, although it, something that occupies space and time in a restricted way. I have to back up again. Sorry, I know this is all review. I'm just saying this to review what we did last time, but let me back. I always, I have to back up one sentence. Anything we study in physics, occupy space and time, right? I guess I have said that a couple of times already today. Specifically, anything that we study in physics occupies space and time in a measurable, reproducible, predictable way. If it does, then it's in the realm of physics. If it doesn't, then it's not the realm of physics, right? So anything we're talking about is occupying space and time in a measurable, reproducible, predictable way. But the thing about particles is that the way that they occupy space and time is restricted. Particles cannot perform task number three or task number five from last time, meaning that what it really literally means to be a particle is to be something that cannot occupy two space points at one time point, cannot be in two places at once. That's what it means to be a particle, right? And, similar, and furthermore, a particle is something that cannot occupy one point in space at one point in time, while another particle occupies the same space at the same time. A particle cannot co-occupy a point in space at a point in time with another said particle, and a particle cannot split. So a particle must be localized. It must be, at any given moment in time, there must be a coordinate set of three coordinates of space that it occupies. Right, like like a particle can be described by a, in our three dimensional space in our one dimensional time. A particle is something that can be always described by a unique set of four coordinates: three space coordinates and one time coordinate. Right, a particle is in one place at one time, and it's the only particle there. Right, that's what it means to be a particle. Now, let me remind you. The big takeaway from last time in a weird, like roundabout way was that's not true of all things in life. And it's not even true of all things in science or physics. It's true of all particles. It's not the case for water waves, sound waves, um, uh, gravitational fields, electrostatic fields, electric currents, magnetostatic fields, or electromagnetic radiation, otherwise known as light. 
all of those things that I just mentioned, which hopefully you maybe you wrote down last time or you're writing down right now, or you're gonna have the guts to say in the uh, chat that you'd like me to list them more slowly because that's a specific list. Like that is not an arbitrary list. And it essentially is the curriculum of this course once we get rolling. Um, so I will say one more time now, but please like have this list somewhere. I'm saying mechanical waves such as water waves, okay? Sound waves, gravitational fields, electrostatic fields, electric currents, magnetostatic fields, magnetic fields, in other words, um, and electromagnetic radiation, aka light. All of those things represent examples of entities that actually exist in the real world, in physics. They all represent things, stuff, that does occupy space and time in a measurable, reproducible, predictable fashion. Yet, all those things I just mentioned, let's say specifically, the, sort of the, I think, kind of the hallmark example of all of them, sound, which we will spend a lot of time studying in this class, like soon-ish. Sound is real, like, duh, right? Duh. But I mean, like, sound is, is not, like, magic, or outside the realm of science, it's it's not only real and common and commonplace and useful, but it's like totally studyable, right? So I, I believe in sound as much as I believe in, in, in electrons, for sure, or planets, for sure, right? But sound absolutely violates restriction number three from last class and restriction number five. Two sounds can be in one place at one time. And they and they don't just can be sort of by weird technical accident. They must be all the time. Otherwise, we would never have chords or any kind of, right? We, sound would be a very simple phenomenon if you were always only literally hearing one note or one tone at one time. You're not. You're always hearing a whole bunch of things at once. Right, whether it's in the context of music or conversation or crowd or what, right? Obviously you are, and you'd be, but it would also be dangerous if you could only hear one sound at one time. It just occurred to me, we live in New York City for heaven's sakes, or at least some of us do, um, right? Of course, more than one sound can occupy your ear at in one time in a very real, important way. Furthermore, Furthermore, there's never, it is never the case that I could say that a sound is literally only at one place at one time. A sound is necessarily in motion, like necessarily changing its position from one place at one time to another all the time. Like if sound were to freeze, literally, if a sound were to freeze and not be, it wouldn't be a sound anymore. I mean, we're going to get to that. That may or may not be obvious, but it is true. Um, so you can't even pin sound down. It's not a matter of accident. It's a matter of its definition, which we'll get to. But you cannot localize sound and say it's literally only here, right here, but it's not over there. No, it's a kind of wave. Waves are spread out. Um, anyway, I'm saying everything we study in this class ultimately is of that nature. Sound is, I think, the most relatable and most vivid example of anything we study in this class in a way, but the ultimate goal is to study light. That's, or at least get a glimpse at it. Pun sort of intended. Um, uh, the ultimate, so the purpose of this class, and I will get rolling in a second, is to study things that really do exist, that really are in science, that really are part of physics, that really do occupy space and time in a measurable, reproducible, um, uh, um, predictable way. But we're here this, and to use the principles and practices, i.e. the equations and the habits that we established last semester. We're here to do physics again. We're here to apply the same rules, but this time to a set of entities that are far more abstract, that are far less thingy than last semester. Bottom line, okay, summary of the whole thing. Last semester we studied, and again, please write this phrase down, even though I'm not, because I want I don't want to get myself rabbit holed, so I want to move on to the homework, but please write this phrase down if you did the following phrase down if you did it last um week. Um last physics one, physics 203, whatever you call it, whatever college you're coming from, classical mechanics, we study the trajectories of particles. 
We study the paths of particles. But in Physics 204, we study the flow, what is really known as the propagation of information. Okay, the ultimate word, as far as I'm concerned, for something that exists, something that's real in physics, but is not a particle, something that matters in the world, but isn't matter, the word I say for that is information. You may have heard words like energy or waves or pulses or things like that before. And I'm not saying any of those words are wrong. I'm just, I think just think they're deceptive ultimately. And also I think some of them don't carry, cover all the categories at once. So I think what we're here to study is how information flows from one place to another, rather than how a particle follows a path from one point to another. Okay, that's a summary of the class. Again, if you, and that, that was real, I mean, I know I'm speaking without writing it down, but that's like real content. If So please do tell me in the chat privately if you missed any of that. Um, um, now, what all that means and why I kind of wanted to say it two days in a row. Like, so, okay, so hopefully you see it is real. Like it was all the silly stuff that we did last time was to make that point. Okay, now why do, first of all, I just want you to know what we're studying. I want you to know what the curriculum is. Okay, to be prepared. But also now what we get into is like, okay, the stuff that we're studying is more abstract. Wait, I'm looking at the chat. I'm sorry. Wait, uh, no, it looks like the chat is fine. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I kept saying, tell me in the chat to say the list. And then I didn't look at the chat. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So hold on a second. So, oh, she did say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you, Shawnee, for the guts to say that. I'm sorry. I will say the list one more. In fact, yes, I will say the list one more time. My bad. Uh, I totally asked you to tell me that. And then I didn't see it in the chat. Um, the list. Yes list and essentially then the curriculum of this class okay is number one mechanical waves you, you you might even call them technically if you want transverse waves that's like the first example of things that can be in two places at once that we study in this class transverse waves such as such as water waves okay like waves on the ocean would be an example okay it would be an example so number one is transverse waves i.e. e.g. water waves. Number two is sound waves, where we spend a lot more time. So number two is sound waves. Number three is gravitational fields. Uh, number four is electrostatic fields, electric fields. So we have water waves, sound waves, gravity, electricity. Uh, then... Then uh, number five is electric currents, like as in through wires, like electricity, like in circuits. That's number five. Then number six is magnetic fields. Technically, they're called magnetostatic fields, but that's okay. That's tech magnetic fields. Um, and then, num so that's, sorry, that's number, I believe I just lost track. I think that's number six. And then the very last one, is electromagnetic radiation, which is ultimately what we call light. Um, hopefully that helped. And Shawnee, let me, oh, oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Wait, okay, thank you, Mohammed, for that clarification. Uh, so that's a really good question. I'm not sure if I miss, okay. I am saying, so Mohammed wrote, so so first of all, again, Shawnee can circle back if she wants and say if she still wants anything from the list, but I'm glad she asked for that. Then Mohammed is saying, um, I am saying that electrostatic fields versus electromagnetic radiation or what you might be calling electromagnetic waves, those are two different things, yes. I think... So the items, okay, transverse waves, sound waves, gravitational fields, electrostatic fields, electrostatic currents, magnetostatic fields, electrostatic, yeah. So they were, that was number, that was number four versus number seven, I believe. They are two different things here. But let me back up and say it a different way. A broad a broad summary of this class for anybody who's like just trying to get a sense of this class before we, a broad summary is or, that we're here to study. You, you could say this, we're here to study ultimately waves, fields, and radiation are three big examples of things that exist that are 
actual like entities, phenomena in physics that don't obey, that aren't particles, that don't obey, that 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 that, that can violate rule number three and rule number five from last class. So like the broad, so the three big words that describe that are three different things are waves versus fields, or I should say two different words. Waves and fields are two different things. And honestly, to back all the way up and slow this down or be more clear, really, you could argue that this class is ultimately about waves and fields, and they are not the same thing. They're very related in that they're both very abstract. Like you can't really like touch either one, or you, we'll talk about that, but you can't really pick, and you can't really count a wave or count or separate a wave from another wave, really. And same thing with fields. They're very abstract, but they are different. Arguably, you could say that the first half of this course sort of builds us to the to the wave equation and to the concepts of waves. And our midterm exams, like right on the hook of like when we've like landed the plane and sort of started to understand what waves are. But then by the end of the course, the second half of the course is about fields. So those are different. Now, elect. So there's a such thing as electrostatic fields, which we'll study. And there's a such thing as magnetic fields, which we'll study. It turns out, not to give anything away, like spoiler alert, but like sort of the punchline of the class is that when electric fields and magnetic fields interact with each other in a certain special kind of way, they create something called electromagnetic waves, which like brings it sort of back full circle. Um, and people call that radiation. And they also, the simpler word for that is light. So I don't know if that's more information than Muhammad was looking for, but I, but it is a very fair question. I'm ultimately saying to everybody, we're here ultimately to study waves and fields, and then in the in the sort of punchline whole thing, put them together to see what electromagnetic waves, i.e., radiation, is all about. I do so again, Shawnee and. Mohammed, great questions. They can please in the chat like sort of follow up to say whether I did address them or not. Um, but now back, but to, oh 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 okay wait there's a oh 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 okay so yeah cool 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 wow you're taking this class without me if you're good for you that you're taking without me well hopefully now look and to be honest to Mohammed and everybody else look that's like my favorite part of the class in a way like that that's the excite that's really super exciting stuff that Mohammed needs to know for his for his job. Um, I wish we would spend more time on it. I can't promise we're going to spend a huge amount of time on that, but that's, but that is like the grand putting together of all the pieces that we will be trying to establish in this course. Okay. So I'm glad he asked. Now, as far as that, now to back to reality, here's the thing you, what some of you might be wondering, well, um, look, obviously some of you are wondering, can you like shut up? Yeah. Remember, just get to the homework. Yes, I can. I will start getting to the homework right now, but, um, but then what you but you also might be thinking, but what does any of that have to do with the homework? Like, wait a second, that's all very fascinating. Okay, hold on. So I'm starting to I am starting to transition here. I mean, academically, hang on. Um so I'm gonna start going over the questions of the homework, and I'm gonna start by doing them with the five-step method to review it for some of you or to show some of you who've never seen it, like what is I'm looking for. And just like last semester, like I'll start by going over the homework questions, you demonstrating the five-step method, but then after I do a couple of them that way, then I'm just gonna maybe start moving to answers or relevant information and trusting you to know how to do that. Um, but but you, some of you might be saying, well, okay, that's sort of interesting, Yaver, like all that Yaver talk about particles. And, but yes, but I'm here to do the homework, but I'm looking at the homework, you might be thinking, or someone might be thinking, I'm looking at the homework and it's a freaking mass on a spring. Like what that, what does that have to do with all these crazy things that you're saying? Like, that's not sound. That's not light. That's not like, that it looks like a particle to me. And you are correct. If you think a mass on a spring it is a particle, like it is. In fact, that's one of the reasons the homework is called that. It is. This first homework, we are given a particle of mass. It is absolutely a particle. A fixed. Is a fixed even a word or only if I live in Tennessee? I'm not sure. But uh, a fit. And don't get me wrong. Some of my best friends. I mean, I, I lived in. 
Louisiana for four years. I lived in North Carolina for one year. So some of my best friends commuted from Tennessee. Not really, but sort of um, affixed to... Um, what does this have to do? What does a mass on a spring have anything to do with physics 204 or nonparticles? It's a transition. And here's what I mean. Elasticity. Okay, just so you see where this is going, just so you have a picture and so it's hopefully less confusing. Homework 1B that we're about to go over, partly it's to review concepts that you need from, from the last class or to refresh them or re reinforce them. But, but also, we're here to build up non-particle entities. We're here to build up uh, understanding and a visualization of how raw information can flow from one space to another in the physical world, how motion can occur in a manner that does not involve particles, okay? Well, there's gotta be a way that that happens. It's, I mean, it's, it's not magic and it's not out of nowhere and it's gotta be related ultimately to things that we know in physics, otherwise it's not physics. So it turns out that one of the fundamental ways to create a flow, to create a ripple, to create a pulse of information, to create a wave. One of the ways to create a non-particle motion is by putting together a whole bunch of oscillations, of vibrations, of a special type of oscillation called harmonic oscillation. In order to get raw information to flow from here to there, you have to set up a bunch of little of little particles, all of which oscillate at, in a very special pattern over the course of time and space. So what we're really, so this homework assignment, what this homework assignment is partly to review and partly to transition, but it's really also to introduce us or to get us granted in this concept of harmonic oscillation which is uh, the the vital ingredient from which we build waves and ultimately fields and radiations and all that, okay? So ultimately what this homework is, is to get us to, to learn the math that we need for the physical process of harmonic oscillation um, and that we need to create waves and things of that nature. Okay, so that that's the perspective. So let's all start going over it now, finally. Okay, so um, so we're given. So step one. So I'm going, so those of you who've never had a class with me before or don't know, again, if you look in under tools in the Google Classroom, there's a thing that says five-step problem solving method. That's what I'm about to embark on right now. I mean, I'm going to expand, show, demonstrate it right now. Um, so step one for doing for solving any problem um, in a homework or an exam, DFP, i.e. we present the diagram and the fact pattern. So, um, and again, I won't drag this all out every time. 
in the future, but just to get us all on the same page. So um, first I draw the diagram. Now in this case, I was sort of given a diagram. So it's mostly at my disposal to copy. That's great. I won't be always given a diagram. The diagram won't always be complete. And no matter what, I can't cut in. I, I'm not cutting. I'm not, sorry. I'm not electronically copying and pasting it. I'm I'm by hand copying it, If and that's fine. Hold on, I'm just changing the view on the screen. Okay. Even if I hand copy it, that's fine if there was one provided, but but there ha but I have to produce one, one way or the other. So, So here's the diagram. And notice in the diagram, everything's sort of written in general terms. Oh, sorry, there was one over here. Right. Um, but then so everything's written in general terms. The key point of the diagram, as I've said before to many of you, that you'll know it to help. It's not, it's not a problem solving diagram. It's a problem presenting diagram, right? It's the fact of the situation. It's not a solution yet. In other words, it's not a free body diagram. It's not a graph. It's not a tool. It's a presentation of the fact. And specifically you'll know, but it's also not just a random rough sketch. It's not just to give you an idea. Specifically, you'll know you've done a proper diagram if every letter that you're ever gonna use to do the math like every constant or every variable that you're ever going to use in the equations that you're going to present, um, if every one of those letters is presented as a label in this diagram, then that means the diagram has done its job, that all your constants and variables have been defined graphically, uh, you know, visually. So they, they have been here. Now I can go down, like now I know what I mean by X naught. I know what I mean by M. I know that I mean by K is the stiffness of the spring. But now it happens that this problem also provided some numbers. So I'm going to include them here. I'm going to say like below, like, okay, it happens that K in this case is 200 newtons per meter and M in this case is 0.3 kilograms. And uh, what do you call it? Uh, X naught in this case is 0.15 meters, right? So there's my diagram. In fact, that, that's a situation. Again, I kind of just hand copied it from the sheet. That's fine. As long as I included everything I needed to and, and nothing more. Um, now, if I start doing math soon, I'll know what my letters mean. That's the idea. So that was step one. Okay, I'm going to the next page. And stop me. I'm looking to chat. Wait, okay, I am watching the chat or trying to watch chat, but definitely stop me if I, right? So that's step one. And notice, and you get, and if this were an exam, you'd get points for having done that. You'd lose points if you didn't. And you notice I haven't gotten a single answer yet or done like any, you know, I haven't done any work. I don't even know any physics yet. I'm just like carrying on a responsible scientific conversation. Um, uh, hence, I get points. All right, so now then step two. Step two is WIQ, what is the question? Crucial. Sounds so stupid, but it is so crucial. I had to learn the hard way so many times as a graduate student how important this is, really. So now I'm going to present the question. Um, and all this makes, you know, again, for those of you who are new to me or I'm new to you, um, all of this is assuming that like you've got the problem sheet over here as though it were an exam or this is an exam. So you've got the exam booklet like over here, you know, in one on one side of your desk whatever, and everything you're writing out is on blank white paper, whether you're typing it into the computer because you're good at that, which I'm not, um, or you're writing it out. This is all blank white paper. So it's like absolutely important that you make the, the, the question clear now, even if it seems like on the sheet, it's clear. Um, and you're going to distill it down to its essence. I don't know if you've noticed, you may have noticed, I often use way a great many words to say very little, right? Not a good habit, especially not as a scientist. So you, and the sheet accidentally sometimes does that too. You want to distill the problem down to its essence. So if we're talking about problem one here, which I think we are, I, I mean, we're talking, we're talking about, yeah, problem one of, of homework 1B, I believe the question of problem one in simplest uh, but most informative terms was something like at X equals X naught, what is F, right? That is literally the question. And I'm not saying you have to notice, 
I'm not saying you have to drag it all out in English. You can totally be symbolic about it, but you have to include, but you have to say everything that needs to be said about the question. Here it is. I mean, the question is, at, I'm specifying the condition at, and tell me if I'm wrong, by the way, in the chat, I think this is the question at X equals X naught, like, or, or, or you could say at X equals 0.15. That's fine too. Um, what is F? That's what we're looking for, right? That's a question. Um, I'm looking at the chat. Okay. Uh, 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 and you get points for that and you lose points if you don't do that, even if, again, not to dwell on it. Well, but if you, even if you know the answer in your head already, if you skip straight to the answer, you won't get full credit. There's a thousand reasons. I won't go into it all right now, but the harder questions get, the more this helps you. The easier questions seem, the more this seems annoying. I totally do understand that. Um, but so that's the question. Solve for F and X equals not, uh, X naught. Okay. So that was step two. So now we go to step three. Which is GDP. General definitions and principles. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, now this, again, please note, we're already at step three out of a five step process. And even up here at step three, you haven't had to figure, you haven't had to like churn, do any physics solving yet. That is on purpose. This is all setting up the table for solving. That's a mixed metaphor. This is all like setting up the situation so that you can solve. Again, if you already knew how to solve in your head, you'd find this all to be a big waste of your time. I know that. But the more physics problems don't seem obvious how to solve them, the more it's because we need to spend more time setting up what it would mean to solve them. We need to break down the... Anyway, these steps help you if you don't know what you're doing. And they, and they only help if you practice them when you do know what you're doing. It gives you a movie of what's going on in your mind when you do know what's going on so that when you don't, you can slow down that movie, watch it and play it and get to knowing something that you didn't know before. So anyway, at this point in step three, we write down the general definitions and principles. That means the stuff we know, the stuff we know, right? But notice there's a subtle distinction here. Step one, we already wrote down the stuff we know from the problem. Step one, we wrote down the facts of the problem. So that's one version of what we know. But now in step three, we're writing down what we knew, what we know, even before we see the problem, even before the problem presents to us on the page. We're writing down things that we know in the universe that are true, whether or not this problem is being asked. That means definitions, laws, principles. That means often things that are phrased with triple equal signs rather than double equal signs. In this case, what we need, in this case, I mean, an example, in this case, what we need, so we need something that we would be true whether or not the problem is being asked, but would be somehow relevant or helpful to the problem. So I think the big thing that we need here is this. Actually, I'm going to, well, yeah, I'm going to write this on the next page too. Now, some of you know this very well from other classes. Some of you, if you had me, don't know this very well. Some of you had been investigating this in lab for at least a period, and maybe were very confused when you saw it in lab. So let's talk about this for a second.
Okay, let me break this down for a second. Now, again, here's something that here, and here's where I will want some help in the chat because here's where your people at different places. Like, so first of all, in principle, again, in principle, this is a law from classical mechanics. Like whether you studied it much last semester or you didn't, and if you had me, you probably didn't, and that's fine. Um, uh, but but I'm saying it's not, it's it, technically it's like from the era of Newton and all of that. It's from a man. So this law is called Hooke's law. Hook was a contemporary of Newton's. So it's from that, you know, it's from like the late 17th century, early 18th century of physics. Um, uh, and again, I think you got some exposure to this for the, for the first time in the lab last week. And it may, it may be very disorient. It's always disorienting learning, th seeing things first in the lab and then on paper. But of course, that is the nature of physics. Like it, that we get this stuff ultimately from the experimental or empirical world and then try to mathematically work it out. Um, so what we're saying with this law called Hooke's law, what we're saying is, well, here, I'll go to the next page. I'll draw the diagram again. If you have a spring and it's attached rigidly to one uh, end and then it's attached to a particle at the other end, Okay, so we have a spring that we consider to be essentially, approximately, largely well-behaved. Well-behaved means basically three things. It means the spring is pretty tight, but not only is it tight, so this is a spring, like a normal everyday spring, like a spring in a watch or a spring in a piece of gym equipment or a spring in a car or in a jack, holding up a car, whatever, a spring, large or small. It's a well-behaved spring. It's a spring that will obey Hooke's law if, number one, it's tight and basically tight to the same level of tightness all throughout from the fixed end to the non-fixed end okay number two if the spring is long if it's long now that could be any size it could be a watch spring or it could be a car jack spring or a truck spring but as long as the spring is long compared to any amount of displacement any amount of compression or expansion that the free, the unfixed end, or the end that's attached to a particle, any amount of motion that one end is going to undergo, that amount of motion has to be very small compared to the length of the whole thing. Like it would take two different measuring piece, uh, tools. Like you would need a meter stick to measure the size of the spring, but you would use like, like, a, like a, a micrometers or something to measure, or, you know, millimeters uh, to measure how much the end of the spring goes out or comes in. Oh, I see something in the chat. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, actually, fair enough. I mean, sort of a joke, but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm glad you have experience in that area. Right. I mean, yes, agreed. Um, and obviously, yes. I mean, if you can picture this from any experience you have in life, that helps a lot. Um, I, oh, okay. And I'm going to dwell this for one more second, just because I love the participation. Like, and again, as always, and I know Chris is like, Hardly joking, but like not really. He's like bringing experience to bear 
on the situation. Right. Okay. So yeah, like, like, and let me just say any scary thing that Chris is talking about or any idea of a spring breaking or a carjack breaking, that is a dramatic version. When we say a spring breaking, literally breaking is dramatic and scary, but break, but any version of breaking means breaking down and means no longer meeting one of these conditions and therefore no longer obeying the law that I'm about to circle back and establish Hook's law, right? Like when a spring is behaving well, it's long and then it's free to extend or compress on one end. And I actually probably should add as one of the conditions, but I, I won't. Like we, if the spring is well behaved, if it's long, if it's tight, if it's uniformly tight, and if it's light, if the spring, even a carjack spring, which are certainly they're heavy, but they have to be very light compared to the thing that they're jacking, that they're attached to at, at one end. Whatever the spring is moving back and forth at one end, the mass, the particle that we focus our physics on, that has to be the mass that dominates. Um, and the spring acts as like a force effing on that MA, so to speak. This, once you attach something to a spring, the thing that you attach to a spring has to be so much bigger than the spring that we can all agree that the spring is doing activities to the thing, not the other way around. I mean, not in any way that we care about. Okay, so. Right. Wait, right. Like what Katie's saying. Exactly. Like, like the spring in a car jack is definitely big and it's heavy and all that. Like it seems like if you brought it into our physics lab, it would be like preposterous. But compared to the thing that it is acting on the car, like just what Katie's saying, it's totally light. And that's as it should be. Right. Okay. Good. So I'm glad you all have experience in this area. That's awesome. Well, that's it. All right. And that, by the way, I'm not even going to joke. That is fascinating. That is a real, and it's cool that Chris knows that or that Katie knows what she's talking about. That is, I'm not, but that's like another area of physics that's super cool, but I'm not even going to pretend to get into right now. Like I don't want to confuse people, but yes, awesome point. Um, okay, so what I'm here to say is from here on in, when we picture a spring, we picture a coil of metal, okay? And we picture it meeting these conditions. We picture it sort of long compared to whatever, we picture that it's going to be able to extend or compress equally on one end, like one end is fixed, but the other end is going to go out and in with equal freedom within a small range compared to the whole item. We're going to stick a mass on that extra end there on the free end. We're going to watch as the spring brings the mass in and out. We're going to call, as we did in the sheet, whatever, whatever place that end of that spring would be sitting there on its own without any help, like wherever it sits right before we stick the mass on it, or sort of like you did in lab, that place we call X equals zero, or in the lab, maybe you call it Y equals zero, because in the lab, the springs were vertical, and that's totally fine. That's to make measurements easier. That's fine. It doesn't change any of these concepts. Um, that place we call zero, we call it equilibrium for the spring, and any measurement out on one side of that equilibrium we'll call X, like five centimeters away from equilibrium. If it's on one side, we call positive five centimeters. And if it's going the other side, like compression, we'll call it the other direction, negative five centimeters. We make a decision at the beginning and we stick to that decision. So, um, so if X measures how far one end of a spring is from equilibrium, then we've got that we, then there's this law that says, Hooke's law that says the spring will always exert a force on to that mass, a force of elasticity, of a force of elasticity, the spring will always try to bring the mass back to equilibrium. If the mass is on the right of equilibrium, the spring will pull to the left. If the mass is on the left of equilibrium, like if it was a compression rather than an extension, the spring will push the mass to the right. The spring always tries to bring the mass to equilibrium. So we so we call I'm just writing the same thing again.
And you notice it's always restoring. So the force that the spring exerts is always in the opposite direction from the displacement from equilibrium, right? If X is positive, then the force is negative. If X is negative, then the force is positive. Hence that negative sign there. And hence those arrows above the F and the X. It's a vector equation. Direction matters. What we're saying is that the, that the spring always exerts a force to bring a mass back to equilibrium Okay, but then there's this K involved. The key really to the whole equation is this K. What's the deal with this K? What the K is saying is this. And then I'll get, and then I will get back to the pro. I, I am watching the time, but I know we need, I'm just, exp all of, oh, okay. Let me also be clear to anybody who, I'm trying to explain F equals, so sorry, I'm getting a little bit like off on a, this is all an explanation of F equals negative KX. F equals negative KX is the GDP, the step three of solving this problem. I'm now expanding on it because I just know for a fact that some people in the class haven't seen it a lot before or just saw it in lab and were confused by it. So I'm expanding on it like as a teacher. I, when I'm done in a minute or two, then I will expect that you can use it from now on. So I pop... But I'm not saying you'd have to write all of this in your homework every time. I'm not saying that. I'm explaining all this so that you have it. All of this is me expanding on step three of doing the homework. I will return to step four and step five in a moment. Um, you certainly can. The, the first time you're using something in a homework or an exam or the first time you're getting used to it, the more you explain it, the better. And none of this, if this, if you said all of this in the homework or an exam, you'd start, and it was right, I certainly wouldn't take off. But I don't mean to suggest you have to go through all of this every time. I just want to make sure you all know this GDP, this jet, this law, this equation, Hooke's law. So I will. So bear with me for like a minute or two more, and then I'll return to the homework. Uh, I'm saying. I'm saying, if you held a mass on a spring at any given position, any number of meters from the equilibrium spot, and and you were to measure the amount of force that the spring was exerting on that mass, this is essentially what was going on in your lab, or at least the beginning of the lab last week. If you pick spots and hold the spring at those spots, spots away from its natural equilibrium, and you then measured the force that the spring was exerting to try to bring them. Yes, yes, Shawnee, exactly right. That's good. Wait, you didn't wait. Okay, hang on. Yes, you're right. Yes, Shawnee is right that K is the spring constant. That's what I'm trying to explain. I'm trying to explain what that means. And I will be done in a minute, or I hope, I think. But wait, you didn't do springs in, I thought. What did you do in lab? You did angles. Wait a minute, you did angles well yeah yeah but weren't the weights on springs wait no um we we did springs like the first week in lab oh you've had two labs right i'm sorry i'm sorry yeah i forgot you've already had two labs wait wait because today's money you've already had two labs Okay, yeah, I'm referring to the first week. I'm sorry. Wait, and you were confused a lot. Okay, so wait, wait, wait. So I'm glad Shawnee and everybody else is talking about this. I do want to get... 
okay, okay. I, and I don't want to create confusion. And I am partly here always. No, I'm glad Shawnee and everybody else is chiming in because I am here partly to make sure you're not confused by lab. Lab is always going to be confusing at first because you get the ideas first in lab, but then sort of the idea is that hopefully gets straightened out eventually in lecture. So you're always allowed to bring confusion, even if I can't answer them all right away. So hold on, let me pause for a second. Yes, I'm referring to your first lab. And so maybe also I'm wasting your time and maybe it's all clear now, I don't know. But as long as you're bringing it up, just and, and I do want to leave my goal also, so you know, if I'm losing people, especially new people, if I'm losing people, like where is he in the class right now? Um, or where is he in the whole, whatever? My goal before 1.30, I want to at least have gone through homework, a question number one with all the five steps, even though I know most of you probably got the answer. I'm just trying to show you what I'm looking for in the homework, especially if you're new. I won't get much farther than step one. I mean, then question one today. I know you're waiting to hear more of the questions. I totally get that. Um, again, and I'll probably be, I might even when this is over, even extend the due date of homework two to next week. Maybe I'll even do that. I don't mean to confuse people. So bear with me. I always go slow at first. So we're on the same page. So my only goal is to get to the end of question one by the end of this class with the whole five-step method. And, and my main goal of that is to make sure at least by the end of today, we're all on the same page with F equals negative KX. Like if there's a goal for today, it's to make sure that from here on in, we can all clearly use F equals negative KX without any issue. But I'm going to now take a risk and ask one question. What did you do in your second lab? What was your second lab about? It was about angles? Our okay. um, was, second lab was like a string and like we- It was set out. Oh, the pendulum. pendulum. Oh, the yeah, pendulum. Yeah, I think I couldn't think of the word. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Good, fine. All right, so there's no problem. Okay, so thank you for telling me. This is very good. This is very good. Everybody remain calm. Do not anybody jump out of the airplane. Um, So it totally made- So yes, I'm talking about the first lab. Yes, I can see why. Shawnee or other people and other people might still be thinking, what the heck does a second lab have to do? Like, if you're still thinking, well, I don't know what's going on in lab, like, what does it have to do with anything? Uh, that's natural. It is not you. And we didn't make a mistake for a minute. I thought, my God, did we give them the wrong lab? No, no. But like, well, okay, okay. I mean, you can jump out. Just please, here's your parachute. Here's your parachute if you can jump out. The larger issue, okay, the larger topic and even like some people ask me, like, like, and if you're looking at a textbook, for example, it's, I believe we said chapter 16, the larger topic that this is all about is what's ultimately known as harmonic oscillation. Okay, when a mass goes back and forth on a spring or a mass goes back and forth on a pendulum, the ultimate connection, the ultimate thing they have in common is this process called harmonic oscillation. What we are ultimately trying to do with all of this stuff with homework one, homework two, lab one, lab two, we're trying to ultimately show you the mathematics, which are not easy, right? Okay, which are not a joke. But we're ultimately trying to build up the mathematics of predicting harmonic oscillation, whether it looks like this, or it looks like this, or it ultimately looks like an electric circuit oscillating back and forth, like uh, or or a subatomic particle, like an uh, like an atomic system i.e. where this is really going, if anybody really cares, is this is all the groundwork for PCAM. You're going to, I promise you when you're in PCAM, you're going to see this all the time. We're trying to ultimately establish the, the, the mathematics of what it means for a system to vibrate back and forth, back and forth in a certain pattern. And the simplest, sorry, the simplest examples of this very widespread phenomenon can be the absolute simplest, most vivid, not easiest, but simplest, most vivid example can be seen as a mass on a spring. So we spend a lot of time dissecting this homework 1B, all the innards of a mass on a spring, because everything else comes out of that, including pendulums, which was your lab too, um, and, and, and waves and all this other stuff. So that's what's going on. For what it's worth, that's the context. I'm going to now, with 13 minutes left, I'm going to go back to this and just tie up together what I'm saying about F equals negative KX. And I want to say right now, yes, Johnny's right. I'm, what I'm trying to do right now is just make sure we understand what this K is all about. I'm saying that if you took, if you put a mass on a spring and you pulled it out to a certain spot and held it there, 
the spring would exert a force on the spot. Um, and the force would be directly proportional to the spot, to the displacement from equilibrium. In other words, if you held the spring at zero, there'd be no force at all. But the farther out that you try to hold the end of the spring, the more intensely the spring pulls. Hence this straight line, right? Now it happens to be in the third quad in the fourth quadrant, not the first, because it happens to be negative, because we are saying there's a negative sign involved. We're saying that the force pulls back when you go forward, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay, so, but the key point is that it's a straight line, it's a diagonal line. Like unlike gravity, unlike gravity gravity is like a restoring force too if you hold something away from the ground gravity tries to pull something back to the ground there's a deep similarity between the gravitational force um unlike mg like where gravity is a force measured in newtons and and it exerts itself on things that are pulled a certain number of meters away from the ground but the difference is with gravity, just to be totally clear, no, ma you, no matter where you hold something, you hold something five feet above the ground or 10 feet above the ground or 15, the force of gravity is still mg, the weight, it's the same, no matter what, it's a constant, it's a horizontal line, right? So the thing that we're focusing on here, the thing that is special and new about springs, about elasticity, the thing that is asserted by Hooke's law is that actually springs get stronger and stronger as you subject them to a greater and greater displacement. That's the nature of springiness. That is why Chris or Katie or other people like use them to jack up cars or to lift weights in the gym. Like the thing about springs is they're harder to hold as you try to hold them farther and farther out. That's a new concept. That's the concept of elasticity. The slope of this line, like, like let me put it this way. Like the rise over the run of this line, right? The change in force divided by the change in displacement. Or put another way, the extra number of newtons that the spring would exert for every extra meter of displacement that you try to subject it to, right? That's the slope of this line. And that is what is known as K. This is Shawnee's point. K is the spring stiffness, K is measured in newtons per meter. It is how many newtons of strength the spring exerts for every additional meter that you try to displace it from equilibrium. If you don't try to displace it at all, if you just hold it in equilibrium, the spring doesn't exert any force. If you So if the, if the K of a spring, like in this case, I'm getting back to, so back, now back to this problem, the K that was given here, I keep, no, I just suddenly forgot, it was 200 newtons per meter. That means for every one meter that you pull out the mass, the spring is a, pulling back with an additional 200 newtons. So if you pull it to four meters, it's 400 newtons, et cetera. Or I, I mean, uh, if you pull it out to two meters, it's 400 newtons, et cetera. Okay, so that, so K is the, spring stiffness constant of a given spring. It's not constant from spring to spring, like not all springs have the same spring constant, but a given spring has a given constant stiffness that describes it. The stronger, the stiffer the spring, the greater number of newtons per meter it exerts. Okay, so that's my explanation of uh, right. Okay. Right. Right. Now, again, just from here on in, I'm assuming between lab or this or that, you have, that's the concept. That's what there is to know about the elastic force given by Hooke's law, F equals negative KX. It's a force just like gravity or friction or tension. It does everything that forces. It goes into the left side of F net equals MA like any other force. But how it comes about is this new idea that it's directly proportional to displacement. That is a new kind of force for us. So now I'm going to go back to the problem. I know I have eight minutes. So anyway, back to the problem.
Okay, so what we were just to, so I was saying step step three, the GDP. The GDP was F equals negative KX. Right? So I wrote that down and now I just explained it. So now step four. Step four, PAW, which means particular application and work. This is where in step four, you start plugging and trugging. You start taking the actual facts of the, here you take the general principle of step three, the general law, the general equation, and there might be more than one. Sorry, sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, you take the general principle and you apply it to the particularities of the problem, the particular numbers. So in this case, you, you generally I signal the fact that I'm starting a step four by saying something like here, like here, K equals 200 newtons per meter, X equals 0.15 meters. So F equals negative so now i'm like actually plugging in the values so this is step four we're almost done and then i go to step five step five is uh fac final answer Circled. So I can literally say now, using the work that I did in step five, at, oh, oh sorry. Oh, yeah, X naught equals, yeah, 0.15, right. Um, at X equals X naught, F equals negative 30 newtons. Okay, couple quick things. Give me five minutes. Couple quick things. So I know in a way this is just demonstration will go faster and faster as the days progress. I I will right now, uh, right now, just to be clear, I'm gonna give you more time on the homework. I'm gonna right now I'm gonna change the homework that's supposed to be due Wednesday. I'm gonna make it due Monday just so that it's like not confusing or less confusing, hopefully. Hold on. So just keep. So basically what this means is, hold on, I'm changing it right now. And everything will be shifted up and it'll all work out. This always happens. It's all totally fine. Oh, wait, do, yeah, I'll make it do Monday. Today's okay. Um, so what I'm saying is if you've already rocked through all of homework 1B, and you're confident of your answers and you're confident you did the five-step method because it's like you've had this class, before, you know, this type of class before, then fine. Then you just wait for me to keep going over it and and getting back to you. And, get, and that's fine. But if, if, for example, you were stuck on it, this gives you more time. If you think you did some answers, but you didn't do it this way, you're like you didn't know how to show your work or you didn't show your work, this gives you time to go back and that this is the way I want you to show the work. Like, I, I think many of you got this first answer hopefully by just plugging in your head, but I do want to see this work. I uh, um One little step, and again, and then I'll go over question two and question three, but I'll condense them as I, I won't drag them out as much. Uh, uh, one thing is I'm getting the answer negative 30. Now that is because one thing I failed to do in my original diagram for all of my talking, in my original diagram, I should have added one more really important thing. Um, and it is on the sheet, but I should have put it here. I should have said, to my mind, to the right is positive and to the left is negative. Uh, it's real part of the point of an original diagram is to label the coordinate system, to choose a coordinate system. Now, what I'm not demanding, you could have made an opposite choice. You could have said that to the left is positive and to the right is negative. I, that's fine. I maybe slightly less convenient, but it's fine. But you have to make a choice. And I failed to do that, or I failed to put it on the paper. I'm choosing to say that 
that displacement on the right side of zero is positive. Therefore, and, and you can tell that because X naught is positive 0.15. If I make the opposite choice, then X naught would have to be negative 0.15 because it's on the right. So given that choice, given that the initial displacement was in the positives, then the force, the way I work it out, is negative. Like my answer is the correct one, assuming I did the correct thing of labeling my coordinate system. If you labeled your coordinate system the other way, then you'd get F equals positive 30. That's fine. But there does have to be consistency. Uh, and the negative signs do matter. So um, this answer, negative 30, means not that the force is getting lower and lower or anything like that. It just means that the spring is at this moment at, or at this spot, at this point of space. Oh, oh, OK. Oh, did it? OK. Oh, did it? Oh, oh cool. Awesome, Charlie. I'm psyched. Cool. So good. And hopefully this won't get any word like so we'll go over the next question, uh, next class. But yes, all this means is at this point in space and time, the spring is exerting a force of 30 newtons to that direction, toward equilibrium. In another moment or in another spot, the force might be different uh, and all that. But that's the answer to that one. That's all we've done so far. Okay, but you guys have been very patient. Thank you for following the crazy road. Uh, obviously, I'll upload the PDF and the video afterwards. So no new homework for a little while. We'll just keep going over this now that we're on the same page. I'm going to ask, but I'm going to hang out right now. If there's any question, I'll turn off the recording, but I'll hang out for any questions or anything like that. Other than that, have a great, and I'll be there tomorrow if anybody uh, wants to come by. Have a great, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Okay. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome.